both Lillian and me, we want to express our sincere appreciation for the invitation and opportunity to be with you for these three days. We'll take back with us to Plymouth, Michigan, many happy memories, and among other things, a few mosquito bites. <laughs> but we do thank the Lord for the work here. We have known about it, not in great detail, but now we have seen it in some detail, and it's just been a real joy and privilege to meet so many of the Lord's people for the very first time, and we trust perhaps this side of glory once again. And if not, then as has already been indicated through song, someday we'll meet in the Father's house, and what a grand day that will be for all of us who know and love the Lord Jesus. I'm reminded of the fact that all good things have to come to an end. At least that expression is often vocalized and we say it in relation to this last of our five messages and our joy together in fellowship around the word and in singing and in the prayer meetings that we've had and so on. But we do know that someday when we get to heaven that'll never end. So we have that to look forward to. When I was quite young, I came in contact with a preacher who's now with the Lord. He died fairly young. He was an Irishman, and he was a man who was gifted in the gospel. And also, I sat under his ministry on occasion and enjoyed his teaching of the word. His name was David Kirk. And I was at a conference one time, just as a listener, just in attendance. I couldn't even tell you now where that conference was because it was so far back in my experience. I think I was still in school days at the time or at least just after my days at Dallas Seminary. But I never forgot something that he said. In his ministry at the conference, he said, no conference, be it long or short, should ever break up without at least one message centering on the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. I put that in my computer. I never forgot it. And this is why I have a hard exercise this evening to at least in part bring before you something of the return of the Lord Jesus. This is the blessed hope of the church. It's the blessed hope of the Christian. So we want to have you turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, please. And I'd like to introduce this letter very briefly. In fact, I'd like to take you through the whole letter. Don't think that I'm going to preach till midnight. I'm not. I'm not the Apostle Paul. And I couldn't do that, and I wouldn't do that. But... I am going to take about 35 minutes to have us look into God's Word, and I'd like to give you a little overview of 2 Timothy, and then we'll concentrate on three verses in the last chapter. First of all, as we come to this letter, chapter 1 unfolds to us in precious detail, something of our infinite Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. And we read about him as Paul wrote. This is the last letter that he wrote. And it's good for us to consider the last words of such a great man as the Apostle Paul, a man whom God made great. I once reviewed a manuscript for the Wazo Brothers publishers. I used to be on their committee. I guess I still am in a vague sort of way, but have not been able to function in the last few years. But they used to send me manuscripts. And I would have to read the manuscript and evaluate it, then fill out a paper and give my comments and so forth. And there was one manuscript that I reviewed one time that centered on the last words of 
different ones, preachers included, that they had uttered before going into eternity. And I found it most interesting. I'm just sorry that that manuscript was not published. But here we have the last words eternally inscribed as part of the eternal, living, powerful word of God on the part of the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy, and giving him this last counsel, these final words from this seasoned veteran of so many, many campaigns in the service of Jesus Christ. And he speaks of our infinite Savior who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, verse 9 of chapter 1, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This word abolished indicates the annulling of the power of death. Death is the believer's last great enemy. The Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross permitted death to sting itself to death on him. And so our sins were taken care of. And we find that Paul says, I am appointed a preacher of this gospel, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And I love this text, for which cause I also suffer these things. He was in prison for the name and sake of Christ. And he says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I commend to you our infinite Savior and these wonderful details that center on him in this particular chapter, in this letter, and of course, this is the book that testifies of him, both Old and New Testament. Then we come to chapter 2, and we have a sure foundation. My, I'm so thankful to be on that solid rock foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says in verse 19 of chapter 2, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Some translate this, the sure foundation of God standeth. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. He knows whether you belong to him. I don't. I pray that each one here this evening belongs to the Lord, that you know him, that you can say with Paul, I know whom I have believed. But God knows those that belong to him. The Lord Jesus knows those that have confessed him. And I trust, I pray that you're one that knows and loves the Lord Jesus, that you're on that one solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ. And then there's a practical side. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Then in chapter 3, we have our infallible guide, the Word of God. And that chapter closes with these words. He reminds Timothy that from a child, and I can relate to this because from a child I too have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, that is mature, truly furnished unto all good works. And then finally in chapter 4, we have our imperishable hope. And the apostle speaks of the fact that the Lord Jesus is going to appear. 
He says in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick, that is the living, those that are here when he does appear on earth, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here we have our imperishable hope. And he mentions that appearing, as we will notice in just a moment, down in verse 8. So I commend these themes to you as sort of an overview of this wonderful letter that's so practical and helpful. I commend it to young people to get into this letter, to make it part and parcel of your being as a young Christian. I've been greatly blessed by this letter in so many, many ways when I was first introduced to it as a young person. Our infinite Savior, our sure foundation, our infallible guide, the scriptures, and then our imperishable hope, the fact that Christ is going to appear a second time without sin unto salvation. He appeared the first time, as Hebrews tells us, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself on Calvary's cross. But he's coming again someday soon, I believe. Everything seems to indicate that in our world and the light of the scriptures to take you and me, believers in the Lord Jesus, out of this world home to be with himself. Now, the three verses that I want to focus on are verses 6, 7, and 8 of chapter 4. Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Some years ago, I was invited to Ottawa, Ontario, for a series of meetings. I went to what is called Rita View Bible Chapel. And I started on a Sunday, went through the week, and then finished my series of teaching messages on the second Sunday. In that home, where I stayed during my meetings there, there was a dear elderly gentleman. I stayed with an older couple. In fact, this couple met me at the airport when I went into Ottawa rather late at night following a Food for the Flock annual meeting in Toronto. Food for the Flock was a magazine that I edited for many, many years. Served first of all as associate editor with the late James Gunn, and then he dumped it in my lap, and for 15 years I had the major responsibility for that. It was a good discipline. I feel I learned a great deal through it, and it was part of the Lord's work that he gave me to do. We, after 35 years, decided that we should close shop in 1989, so the magazine ceased publication at that particular time. But this dear man, Archie Howitt, was his name. He was an elder at the assembly there. And I enjoyed very much my visit with him and with his dear wife. And it wasn't too long, perhaps just a few years after that, that he was at the breaking of bread meeting, the Lord's Supper. And at the close of the meeting, toward the end of the meeting, he stood up and he read these three verses that I just read to you, and I hope you followed along. He sat down and he went to be with the Lord. These were his last words that anyone ever heard from him. And I thought, well, what a wonderful way to depart this life. He was active right to the end, and the very last words he spoke were these words of the Apostle Paul, among the last words that Paul ever wrote. I want us to look at these three verses. We'll take a few minutes on each verse, and the first thing we want to note in relation to Paul 
was his soon release. Verse 6. Paul spoke of his impending death in a twofold way. Paul was about to be martyred. He was about to be put to death. And we have here in verse 6 the thought of the drink offering. Paul does not refer to his martyr death as a bird offering or in relation to any of the other main sacrifices, but as a drink offering of a little wine and oil which was added as a small supplement to the main sacrifice. And if you want the background of this, you have it in Numbers 15, 1 through 10. But what I want to do is to relate verse in relation to Philippians chapter 2, 17. This is why I see in relation to verse 6 the fact that Paul, when he says that he is soon to depart, I'm now ready, literally, I am already being offered. I'm sure he has the drink offering in mind. And in Paul's joy letter, which was one of his four earlier prison letters, this is what he says in verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Paul had spoken there in Philippians some years before of the possibility of his being poured out as a sacrifice, a drink offering, on the altar of sacrificial service. And again, I say we won't turn there, but the background of that drink offering, it's most interesting and instructive, is found in Numbers 15, 1 through 10. Interestingly enough, Isaiah 53, verse 12, presents the illustration of our Lord who poured out his soul unto death in that whole burnt offering of himself to God. And of course, as our sin offering. A given sacrifice, Paul looks at his life as that which was poured out in sacrificial service for the glory of the Lord and the blessing of sinners and saints alike. Literally, as I've indicated, he is saying, I am already being offered. And in relation to his soon release, we have his reference to his departure here in verse The word for departure is a beautiful expression that has manifold meanings. And I'm indebted to the late Guy H. King, who has summarized in one of his books, including his delightful exposition on 2 Timothy entitled To My Son. I recommend it too. If you've never read it, to me, it's the best English exposition, the best devotional English exposition of Paul's second letter to Timothy. He has summarized the ancient meanings of this particular word for departure. He says, he tells us as he has researched this, that it was a prisoner's word, referring to a prisoner's release. It was a farmer's word, referring to the unyoking of an ox after a day's labor. Even an animal enjoys some leisure. It was a soldier's word, referring to the striking of a tent. It was a seaman's word, referring to the unmooring of a ship. Many a time I went with my mother, because I was born and raised in New York City. Our home was open to missionaries, and we often had missionaries staying with us, and they would be on furlough, and then they'd be leaving from New York City on a ship to return to their field of service. And on occasion, I had the joy of going down to one of those docks, and here was the ship on which the missionaries would be sailing, and I would watch with much interest as a boy, as that ship had the lines unloosed, unmoored, 
and it would be pulled out by a tug or two into the harbor and then get on its way. And this is part of the picture of this word. And then it was a philosopher's word referring to the unraveling of a difficult problem. How good to know that in both life and death, we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 3115, my times are in his hand. Perhaps that was a text that Paul thought of as he wrote these words. But he says he's ready. He's ready to go. The time of my departure is at hand. I love the quaint little story that I came across some time ago of two Cistercian monks in the reign of Henry VIII. They were threatened, these monks, by the Lord Mayor at that time. These monks were out-and-out -out Christians. They loved the Lord Jesus. And in view of their testimony, they were threatened by the Lord Mayor at that time that they would be tied in a sack and thrown in the Thames River. My Lord Mayor, answered one of them, we are going to heaven. And whether we go by land or by water is of a, is a very little consequence to us. Paul was going by way of martyrdom. He knew that his time was short. He knew that he would soon be put to death. But he says, I'm already, from my viewpoint, being offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. His soon release. We don't know, any one of us, how soon we'll be taken home to be with the Lord. That is if we're ready to meet him, and I hope and pray that you are that you know and love the Lord Jesus. God grant that whatever time remains, we might redeem it, that we might buy up the opportunities that the Lord gives us, which opportunities are increasingly precious in view of the evil days in which we live, and that our lives might be more and more useful till traveling days are done. Then there's a second thing, verse 7. Not only his soon release, but his summary review. He gives us a review here of his life. So succinctly put in these few words. He says, I have fought a good fight. Paul may have in mind here the wrestler, or as some think, the boxer. That doesn't really matter. Literally, what he's saying is, I have fought the good fight. The definite article that's used here in the Greek text stresses the character of the fight, not the way in which he fought, although he fought valiantly. But he says, with all the sufferings that I have endured, with all that I've gone through, and now I'm in prison for the sake of Christ, and I'm not ashamed, it's been well worthwhile participating in the good fight of faith. I have fought the good fight. Then we see Paul the runner. I have finished my course. Like a runner, the apostle had finished his lifelong race in Christ triumphantly. And his words remind us, do they not, of our Lord's words in John 17:4. When the Lord Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, said, I have glorified thee, he's praying to his Father, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And of course, we have our Lord's cr triumphant cry from the cross, the sixth of his seven cries on the cross of Calvary, when in John 19.30, one word in the Greek, Three words in our English. To tell us die. It is finished. Thank God for that wonderful cry of victory. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a savior. And then we have Paul the steward. He says... I have kept the faith. 
Paul was one who ever wanted with an evangelist heart to name the name of Christ where Christ had never been named. And so, to me at least, the third image here is that of Paul the steward. And we are all stewards of the Lord. During World War II years, I was a boy growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and for five years, my parents, and particularly my mother, because my dad was an itinerant Bible teacher and evangelist, so he was away a good bit of the time, but mom had the main responsibility. We carried on a servicemen's work, mainly among Navy men, there in Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn at that time, it still does, but it's pretty much in mothballs, but at that time, it had a huge Navy yard. Ships would come in for repairs, for overhauling, whatever. And the Lord opened up a work whereby some of our brethren from Bethany Chapel, my home assembly, the local church where I fellowshiped and was brought up, would go down to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, contact Navy men, and you know, this wouldn't be done today, but in those days, the Navy actually provided buses to bring those men to church, and then they came to our home in Brooklyn. I remember on one occasion, we had 70 servicemen in our home, in addition to all the people from church that helped out with this ministry. We had a good old-fashioned time of singing, a singspiration. We had tea, coffee, whatever, cake, cookies, just a little taste of home. Testimonies were given. Souls were saved. I still have contact with some of those men that were in our home back in those years. And it was a great work that was done. We have estimated, I wish we had the register of all those that had signed. I don't know what became of it. Maybe when we moved from Brooklyn, it was lost. But we estimate that there must have been 5,000 men go to Bethany Chapel and then through our home in relation to that particular service, that particular work that was carried on. I mention this because I was always interested in the insignia of the different petty officers. And I remember especially the crossed keys. Those that had a patch with crossed keys were stewards on board ship. They had access to the supplies and they were responsible for keeping those supplies and dispensing those supplies. This is the image I see here in relation to Paul, and it's a great thing at the end of life or toward the end of life to be able to say, I have kept the faith. In other words, Paul says, I've been faithful in my responsibility as a steward of the gospel of the grace of God. You see, you and I in Christ really don't own anything. Someone might say, well, there's a blue car out there. Oh, that belongs to Ross Rainey. In reality, it doesn't. Everything I have belongs to him. It's a trust from him. And I have a responsibility to use what he has entrusted to me for his glory. And to seek to be faithful in the dispensing of all the riches, the riches of his grace, the riches of his glory that he's given to me and likewise to you. God grant that we might be faithful. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it's required in a steward, not that he be found successful, but that he be found or she be found faithful. And I believe as I study the scriptures and go through the word of God, I find that God places tremendous emphasis on faithfulness. That's what's required of you and me. 
we sang one hymn here, as I recall, Great is Thy Faithfulness, or else it was sung to us. I don't recall. But he's faithful. God is faithful. Who has called us into the fellowship of his son. God grant that you and I might be found faithful till traveling days are done. And then finally, we come to our third main point, and that is his sure reward. I want us to note five things about this sure reward. And this brings us to the thought of the return of the Lord and something that follows his return. But let's notice these things. As to Paul's reward, we see, first of all, the safety of it. Verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. This reward is spoken of here as laid up. It's in heaven. Where moth and rust, and not even Satan himself, can touch it. Here, I believe the apostle pictures himself before the judges stand as a victor about to receive his prize, confident that it was his and that no one could take it from him. I'm reminded of a verse in Revelation chapter 3. You need not turn there unless you wish to refresh your memory along that line, although it's always good to check up on the preacher. But in regard to the message of our Lord to the church at Philadelphia, there's something very significant here, and it relates to the coming of the Lord, and this is in regard to what we have in verse 11. The Lord said to the Christians at Philadelphia there in Asia Minor, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In other words, be faithful in regard to what the Lord has entrusted to you. Be faithful in your service. And don't let anyone take your crown. You know, it's possible in the Christian life not to finish well. I remember F.B. Meyer and something that he wrote. He prayed that the Lord would enable him to finish well and not end up in a swamp. I have known some Christians that started out well and they went along for a few years and this evening they're in a swamp. They have allowed sin to come into their lives to nullify the effectiveness of their testimony. And they have not been faithful in regard to all that the Lord has committed to them. I do not judge. Judgment is in his hand. But it's a serious thing. And oh, I pray that each one of us, no matter how many years we have down here in Christ, that we'll finish well the course that is laid out before us. The safety of that reward, Paul says, it's laid up for me. Then the significance of it, it's a crown of righteousness. This, beloved, is one of the five crowns of the Christian. I wonder if I gave out a three by five card and said, all right, give me at least four of the five crowns, if you'd be able to name them. Now, if you've been saved five, 10, 15, 20 years, you ought to be able to name four out of the five, I would hope. These are the rewards that the Lord promises in relation to various aspects of faithful service. And I know that when we get to heaven, we'll gladly, if we have any crown at all, we'll gladly cast it at the feet of our Lord. But the Lord teaches us in his word to go after these crowns. Let me give them to you briefly. There's the soul winner's crown, the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. I wish we could turn to all of these, but I'm not going to take the time. And then there's the Christian warrior's crown, the faithful warrior's crown in 1 Corinthians 9.25, the incorruptible crown. 
And then you have James 1.12 with Revelation 2.10, the crown of life, sometimes referred to as the martyr's crown, although it's a crown that will be given for enduring faithfully midst trial. And then there's also 1 Peter 5.4. Maybe we have someone here this evening who is an elder in a local church. And this is the under-shepherd's crown, the crown of glory. Peter speaks about it in 1 Peter 5.4. That when the chief shepherd shall appear, he's going to give that crown of glory to those under-shepherds that have been faithful in their responsibility. And then, of course, there is this crown that has to do with loving his appearing, this crown of righteousness. The word for crown that's used in connection with these rewards is Stephanos, the victor's crown, from which, by the way, we get our name Stephen. And I know we have one Stephen here. The kingly crown is the diadema, and that's used exclusively. It's the word, of course, from the Greek from which we get our word diadem, and it alone is reserved for the Lord Jesus, and that's found, for instance, in Revelation 19.12. The crown of righteousness that we have here is sometimes referred to as the watchful warrior's crown. A.T. Robertson, the famous Baptist scholar, has said that this is a crown that consists in righteousness and is also the reward for righteousness. Therefore, it's a special reward for those believers who have lived soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, borrowing from Titus 2.12. Why do they still live? It's because they truly and consistently love Christ's appearing. I'm going to come back to that, but let's go on here a little bit. The source of this crown, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. There may be, I wouldn't press it, but there may be an implication here that Emperor Nero, the unrighteous earthly judge, had condemned the Apostle Paul to death. In the end, however, the righteous judge would openly acclaim and honor Paul. The scene of it. When is this reward going to be given? And these other rewards that we've mentioned. At that day. And that day, first of all, involves the Lord's return. He's coming. But as I mentioned in one of my messages, after his return, after in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when we're caught up, and taken to the Father's house, to heaven, to be with the Lord. There follows the judgment seat of Christ, a judgment that concerns Christians, not in connection with our sins. They were taken care of at Calvary. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But this concerns our service. And if you go to a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we learn that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Our dear brother, the late Dr. Al Clock, a few years ago, my wife and I, as I have mentioned to some of you, heard him at Curtis Gospel Chapel in Detroit, and I remember what he preached on. He preached on the judgment seat of Christ that evening. That was the main thrust of his message. And he preached with much enthusiasm and fervor and reminded us of the seriousness of someday standing before the Lord and having our service evaluated. God grant that there might be something in your life and in my life when subjected to the fiery scrutiny of our Lord there will be a residue of gold and silver and precious stones. I wish we could pursue that, but we don't have time. But that's the scene of this reward that's yet future. And then the securing of it. And not to me only, but unto all them also. 
that love his appearing. So going back to this crown of righteousness, it's within the reach of every child of God. If you're a Christian, it's within your reach. It's within my reach. It is the Lord's reward for a faithful and righteous life. And the promise of Christ's appearing is the incentive for the believer's faithfulness and holiness of life. The verb for love is in the perfect tense, and I don't mean to get academic, but it's important, I believe, to bring, bring this out because you don't get this on the surface of the English, and we can read this accurately this way. This reward is going to be given for those who have loved. This is the force of the perfect tense. Those who have loved and continue to love. In other words, it's not an up and down thing, waxing hot one moment and cold another. No, this means a steady, constant, durative quality to our love for the Lord's coming, for the Lord's appearing. If we genuinely love our Lord's appearing, then I believe we'll be daily living, longing, and looking for that appearing and listening for the shout. I close with two illustrations. One I'm conjuring up. And it is possible to love the Lord and yet not love his appearing. Let me illustrate very simply. We can take the illustration of a home. Here's a father, a mother, and a child, a youngster. We'll say it's a boy, maybe 10, 12 years, 13 years old. So you've got the scene, you've got the picture. Dad does some traveling, connection with his business. So dad goes away. But in the interim, while dad is away, I dare not say little Willie. <laughs> that came to mind. My first name is William, and I used to get called Willie when I was a kid at times. But anyway, Johnny, whatever, he misbehaves. He gets in trouble. And mom says to him, all right, son, your dad's coming. And when he comes, I'm going to put things in his hands for discipline. Now, that youngster surely loves his father, no doubt about that but he doesn't love the appearing of his father because he knows what's awaiting him. And as we indicated a while back, God grant that we might not misbehave, that we might not allow sin to get into our lives, to nullify the effectiveness of our testimony because there's a day of accountability. And there are some, as 1 Corinthians 3 reminds us, that are, yes, saved, but so is by fire. And it's possible, in accord with 1 Corinthians 3, to suffer loss, not the loss of salvation, but the loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Why should we love Christ's appearing? Because of what it'll mean to our Lord. That's preeminent, that's paramount to me. We should love his appearing because of what it will mean to Christians. We should love his appearing because of what it will mean to this groaning creation. We should love his appearing because of what it ultimately will mean to the Jew, to the nation Israel. But I close with this second illustration. After World War II, there was a sign on the shore of New York City Harbor facing all incoming troop ships. 
and the sign read, all the servicemen out on the decks of the various ships and so on, would see this sign as they entered the harbor. Welcome home. 